everyone. I am so, so excited today to be speaking to the New York Times number one best-selling author, Lisa C. And we are going to be talking about her newest book, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. And she's going to hold it up so we can see the amazing cover of this book. Isn't that beautiful? I love it's, that cover. I, I, I have that little, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little sun coming in here, but it has this really pretty uh, gold that sort of, uh, I, I have to tell you, I was walking through Barnes and Noble and I saw your book up on a display and I am a, I'm a cover person. Everybody who listens to me knows that. And I was like, oh, I never saw, look at that book. So I went home, went on Amazon, started reading your book. I'm like, I have to talk to her. I have to talk to her. And then gratefully you said yes. So I was yes. so excited. This is the first book that I've read of yours and you have many, many others, but, um, I love this book so much, and I have to tell you that when a novel is written about China, I get intimidated. So for everybody out there who's like me, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm you know, Pennsylvania Dutch girl, and the only thing I know about China is what I learned in school, which was not enough. So whenever I, before I've read any books that the setting takes place in China, they never tell me enough that I, I get intimidated. Like I start looking like, what are they talking about? I don't understand. But what you did in this book is you made me really believe, like feel like I'm in this part of China. I really, really felt like I connected on another level that I've never felt before with this book. I, I, I've heard that um, from people about my books that, you know, and that has been my goal as I'm writing is to try to just, feel like I'm in the room with people. And, and you know, because I go there and do all my own research, um, but, you know, one of the reasons to actually go to a place as opposed to just, you know, doing research out of a book is that you have a real, you know, all your senses, right? You can, what it smells like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, everything. And you actually are experiencing, you know, I'm experiencing it myself. And so in my writing, I just try to feel, like I said, like I'm in the room with those people. And so that really, be, um, instead of it being, I'm going to say like from the outside looking into a culture, you're just sort of been dropped in the culture. Absolutely. You know, First of all, I learned so much. And you know what? I kept telling, I, I have six children, okay? And every time I talked to one of them, I'd be like, did you know this about China? Did you know this? <laughs> I learned so much. Like, And one of the first things that I learned was that there's, I think you said there's 55 different... Ethnic different minorities, right? And, and, and the thing is that those are like 55 completely separate cultures from what we think of as being Chinese. I mean, they don't identify as Chinese. They say, well, I'm Aka or Miao or Yi people or Yao people. And so, you know, the group that I wrote about in the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, that's the Aka people. And the Aka are, are nomadic. They historically have roamed between Laos, Northern Thailand, um, Myanmar, and then this one province in China. They have their own language. Um, they they follow a 12-day week. They have their own New Year that isn't Chinese New Year and it isn't, you know, our Western New Year. It's their own New Year. They, they've been described as being very similar to the Cree here in this country. And, you know, it's an animistic tradition so that they believe every single thing has a soul. And, uh, you know, they're very, very interesting people. But there are only about a hundred, sorry, a million and a half of them in the world. Yeah, I, I just, like I said, I learned so much. And even, even, you know, this, so this book's a lot about tea. Okay. Right. A lot. And I am not a tea drinking person per se. It's not that I haven't drank tea. I usually do iced tea in a restaurant, but you know, I started, so here, let me show you this. This is not Chinese tea, but this is from Iran. I, only because oh. I have a friend of mine that 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 introduced me to that. So this is as far as oh, from saffron. it Looks is. Like. It is saffron oh, tea. That's really neat. Yes, yeah, so, very. Neat. And there's a very cool picture on the back of it too. If you can oh, get yeah, the glare. Yeah, that's really sweet. I love it. Very light, very light tasting. So I was introduced. This is as far from Lipton as I have gone. Okay. So, 
<laughs> but now, now I'm like, because of all the stuff that you talked about, I mean, all the healing properties and all the, I was like, why did I never heard of this? You know, and, and I'm really like interested in that. I'm really, you know, I, I love um, natural healing and I, I learned so much about the, you know, because the, the main character, the mom, and I was looking for her name today because I didn't know what else. Um, was well, that's easy. Amma. Right. I was thinking, did you call her anything but Amma? I didn't know if you did in there. But, you know, the I fact don't. that she's a midwife and I gave birth to some of my children through midwives. And, you know, I'm really, now I'm really, really intrigued by tea, which... I, I'm sure after you did all your research, you're like, you know, you feel the same way, but it really... Well, I, I actually have always been a tea drinker, but I am now a tea snob. You're not a tea snob? <laughs> I'm a tea snob. I mean, I'm drinking Kuwait right now, and um, I I just love it. And I, I you know, just the, the sort of history of tea in that it's the second most popular drink in the world after water. That just amazes me. That, you know, how could that be? I mean, I don't know what the what else it could have been, Coca-Cola or something like that. Well, but, I would have thought um, actually, <laughs> yes, but you know, if you think about India and China, right? Uh, the, you know, right there, that's what two fifths, a little more than two fifths of the world's population, right there alone, and they're both big tea drinking um, countries. Although, you know, they obviously have coffee too, but but it's really all about tea. And, and you're right about the medicinal qualities. You know, I think over the last few years, so many people have been drinking um, green tea. And green tea right. does have a lot of really wonderful medicinal qualities. But this tea has quite a few more. Right. This tea I, is I very... Tell you why. Yeah, and I didn't know, like, especially in the beginning of the book, I was like, is she, is this part of fiction or is this truth? You know, of course, no. as we find yeah. out, it's, you know... Yeah. It's truth, but you know. But I was I was really interested in the beginning because I'm like, is this a made up thing that's you know? But then we you know as we get to the back of your book and everything, you find out all the history and you know it was just fascinating. And you don't need me to tell you like what an amazing writer you are, but I'm going to because <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you have everybody else to tell you this, and you have all your you know you've got your your stats and and all your New York Times bestsellers, but. I love this story so much. I mean, as I'm reading it, I'm just telling everybody, you got to read this book. You have to read this book. It is such a great story the way you, you know, I didn't want to miss one word. And that's very difficult in a novel for me, okay? Because in my past, I had read so much nonfiction books that when I switched to reading more fiction, I found myself skimming things, you know? Right, right. And, but, well, or sometimes when, yeah, you can think, uh-oh, oh, it's like I can just skip over that. But no, but I not, don't think you can really skip too much here. No, absolutely not. There was no, nothing to skip. Happened. You know, that's the other thing, that a lot happens to Leanne in, in particular. Yes. That she is on such a journey, and everything... Uh, that happens to her. <laughs> it's just, you know, so, you, you know, she's, it, it's, um, and then of course with the daughter, I guess we should maybe want to tell people a little bit about the father. Yes, like. yes, we should. We should tell everybody that, you know, and, and you wrote it in, um, we go back and forth between Leon's life and then Haley's life. And I found that so interesting because um, at one point, I, I don't know how many years ago, I had actually considered adopting a Chinese baby. And actually looking into it now, I know that's no longer it's it's no longer a practice for the well, most no, part. Well, people still do it, but it's, it's a lot harder for a couple of reasons. One is there um, aren't as many baby girls being abandoned, right? In China, right? So that's that's probably the number one. And then China has actually done a very good uh, job. I mean, it took them thirty years, but you know, to really try to educate. There are people that having a girl is not the end of the world, <laughs> and that you, know, right. that you if you had a girl, you could keep her as your one child. And so those two things together, and then plus, you know, as of I guess just last year, that they changed the one child policy to a two child policy. Right. But but again, it's 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 I think that really that combination of what we want we want our country to keep our girls and to value our girls, and that. You know, um, just you know, more people can have more children too. Yes, and and so you really take this story into 
Um, you know, Leon has a, a daughter and that she can't keep, and, and not for that reason, but for other reasons. And I'm going, I'm going to skirt around because I don't like spoilers at all. We don't like it too much, right? No, I don't want to give too much away with it. But okay, so she has a daughter, and her daughter eventually makes her way to the United States, being adopted. And I loved hearing that story because I do know so many. Um, Chinese girls. I do know, you know, not in the moment, but when my kids were, when I was raising my kids, that's why I had considered it because I'd been talking to other parents who had such great experiences, but never, never did I think, because I watched these children, I watched these little girls who they of course were brought into homes that were extremely, you know, well providing, you know, they were well provided for, okay, more than they could have ever imagined in China. So, so right away you think, well, they're not going to think anything else. What they're going to think is, thank God I'm in America and this American family has adopted me, right? right? And then to be able to experience through Haley's eyes that truth about that, it really, it really made me like think about, I was like, well, wow, I never thought about that, you know? Yeah, I think that is, you're absolutely right that so many, I mean, really all of these young women were adopted by families who had some money, you know, that they, they had could to. afford yeah. to go to China, that they could pay all the fees and all of that. So they tend to be pretty upper middle class, more than that. And and I think on the face of it, as you say, that it, it they should just be grateful and happy. Right. They're just grateful and happy. Here I am. This is great. Right. But, you know, they have struggled with issues of identity, of, you know, in many families, they're the only Chinese space in their families, and maybe in their school, maybe in their church, and maybe in their community. And so they, you know, know that they're different. And um, they wonder sometimes, even though they have this completely American upbringing, it's like, well, what am I? Am I Chinese? Am I American? Am I Chinese American? Or am I something else? And um, they struggled enough, and also just, you know, I think this is 100% across the board for, you know, most adoptees, no matter where they came from or what kind of family they ended up in, that sense of loss for the family that gave birth to them. Right. And, you know, and that wonder, well, why did they give me away? You know, you don't know. Even here, you don't always know why, why that right. happened. And so... They struggled with all of this, and, and they struggled enough that they've been given their own label, the grateful but angry adoptee. Right. And I, over, I interviewed a lot of young women, sort of 18 to about 21 years old, all around the country. Um, and I had a list of about a dozen questions, which I would, you know, I'd meet somebody when I was out on the road, something like that, and I would send out these questions. And when I got back, these were kids in college, you know, working hard in college. What I got back were these letters, 30 to 50 pages long, where they had just completely opened their hearts and shared their experience with me. Wow. And, and so I, I, over time, really came to shift my view of this grateful but angry adoptee. And it was really summed up for me by one young woman who said to me, I know I'm the most precious person in my family. And... You know, think about it. You know, every child is precious in every family. Right. But these parents really went through a lot, typically. Went yes. through a lot before they decided to go to China to adopt. So, um, you know, I know I'm the most precious person in my family, but I wasn't precious enough for my, parent, my birth parents to keep me as their one child. Right. And so, to me, that... I really saw it as less grateful but angry than it is grateful and sad. That you and it and it has that um, sense of you know this kind of hole in the heart that will never be able to be filled, but also a kind of a, a burden in a sense that you have to live up to this wonderful situation that you've been placed in. You know, the, 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 all of the gifts that you've been given. It's like you can't just be like, yeah, whatever. You know, you want to you want to do your best. You want to be grateful, right? And, right? and show that gratitude through your, your own, you know, hard work, et cetera. Yeah, and the, and the little girls that I did know, I at looking back because of reading this, I was thinking, first of all, most of them had siblings that were not adopted, you know, so they were right. the natural children. And then, so right. then they have their fam, 
family and then they go to China and adopt a little girl. Like most of the time, right. the ones that I knew, like they had all boys. And they were right. like, what, what do you do? Well, you know where you can get a girl without, you know, if you go yeah. through American, you don't know what you're, you know, you don't have a preference really if you go through natural adoption here. But they turned out to be little girls that were so, um, like it tried to excel in everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like sports, academics, like tried to be the overachiever. And, right. and maybe that's what, and then after reading this, I'm thinking, well, maybe that's why they tried to show their gratitude in a way. It's like, I'm going to be, you know, grateful. And well, so I'm going to show my parent, my, my new parents, how happy I am by, you know, being, you know, this intense. They were like such intense little girls, which yeah. was outside the normal of, you know, my daughters <laughs> and other, other little girls, right. you know? So it's very interesting. It really gave me some perspective of looking at that, you know, from huh. this from this book and um and i hope everybody you know you have to read this book it is truly amazing not even just for this the story alone of Li Yan is and 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 women you know like especially in this day and age to show like what she did and how she stood up for herself and and how she got through things and and then oh the whole <laughs> the whole story is just you know it's so tear it is a tear jerker you know i just loved her so much i you know so uh, anyway, but th so go get this book. That's all I can say. And I wanted to talk to you about, because I went through your other books, okay? And I was like, oh my gosh, you have written some books, okay? In a very short amount of time, you've written a lot of books. So I wanted to hear, like, how do you do that? And how, how did you get started on this path? Actually, I'm, I'm that fast, actually. I, you don't I, think so? took five years. Key Girl took three years. You know, there are people who write a book every single year. And I don't know, I just happened to see Michael Connolly has a second book out this year. And <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not writing trash. He writes really beautiful, oh, yeah. good, really good, thoughtful mysteries. And I just think, how, how does he do that? I just don't know how he does that. But, you know, mine, mine do have a lot of research, too. So uh, my mother was a writer. My mother's father was a writer. I really grew up around writers and also the writing life. And so I feel like in a way I had a lifelong apprenticeship to become a writer. And um, But my first book wasn't published until I was 40. So I, you know, I guess <laughs> when you're 40 and that's your first one, maybe you have to hurry along. But even that one, you know, it had taken me five years. So... I, I don't know, I, you know, I could tell you each book, how they came about. Um, I, don't, I can't even remember if I wrote about this in the acknowledgments of the tea girl, but, you know, my husband and I, we were going to the movies, and I saw this older white couple walking with their adopted teenage Chinese daughter between them. Mm -hmm. She had her hair on a ponytail and was, you know, swishing back and forth like this. And I had this vision of her as being kind of like a fox spirit in her family. And fox spirits in Chinese tradition can be pretty naughty. They can be very mischievous. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, they also have this ability to bring great love and help create families. And so when I saw that fox tail switching back and forth, I thought, well, yes, she is like a fox spirit in that family in the sense that through her presence, she had brought great love and had helped to create a family. So even though I had been thinking about writing about adoption from China for something like 20 years, and I had it in the back of my head for about 20 years, it was in that moment when I saw her, you know, ponytail that I thought that's what the next book will be. And so, you know, there, I think for me, um, I think about things for a very long time, and I'll sometimes I'm collect, collecting information, but whatever, I, I have it, you know, just kind of percolating back there for a long time. Sometimes it's just that I don't know my way into the story, um, and there was something about seeing that girl uh, and her tale. I, that was when I, you know, it clicked for me. And that was like, okay, I now I see how to go, how to tell oh. the story. And it really was like that fast. It wasn't something like a month later. It was just like, now I know what's next. And, and here's my way in. 
And so that that's actually happened with almost every book, I think, where I come across something or I see something or I read something and it just like it, it triggers something in my head where it's like, okay, now I know how my heart can go into the story. I, you know what I'm just thinking about, um, my favorite part, and I, I don't think this gives away anything, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, uh, because maybe you can clear, you can make it more clear, but, but I love the, the concept of after she has Haley, after Leon gives birth and, and she decides she's going to give it up for adoption and her mom helps her, okay, Ama helps her, she, Leon is having a very difficult time. I love this advice as a mom, and she says something like, turn around and look. And remember, and now go ahead, and now face forward, and right. go. And I've been thinking about that so much since I read it because I was like, as a mom, you know, I connected with that advice so much because you want to help your children, and it's like it's just so simple. Like, right. you know, when your child's going through something difficult, you know, like mm-hmm. not not forget, remember, but right. move forward. Right. Now you have- Forward, you have to still move forward. I I'm working on a new book right now, and and I was just doing some editing while over Thanksgiving, and there was a scene that I just just yesterday went through where it's very similar. It's like some you know horrible things have happened to this one character, but it's in this case her mother-in-law who says, you know, you have to go on living. You have to go forward and of course that's what especially because that character is a mother you know she has to do it for her children too she can't just say you know i'm done with life and and you know we don't really have that option right it's just how do we decide we're going to move forward and um this book you know i i've written a lot about mothers and daughters in yes. in my books um, it, it is, you know, this universal relationship yes. that every single person yes. on earth, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> had a mother somewhere, somewhere along the line. You know, right. maybe you knew her, maybe you didn't, maybe you liked her, maybe you didn't, but we all had one. And so, you know, I've written about them before, but this book is just populated with mothers and daughters. Yes. There's Leon and her mother. And Leon and the baby, and the baby and her adopted mother, and right. adopted mother and her mother, and um, Jin's mother, yes. uh, CK and Deja, you know, also yes. mothers. And each one of them are different and have different relationships with their children, but also um, how they, it's not just about how their relationships are different, but how they think about motherhood differently. And so, I um, like I said, I've written about this many times. I think with Snowflower and the Secret Fan. Well, let me just say, there's this Chinese written character uh, that uh, um, it's just you know one written character that means mother love, and it's combined of two elements. It has one part that means love, and the other part means pain. That that's a mother's love. And, you know, love and pain. And so when I was working on Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I thought, well, I get this completely. This is, you know, a daughter would look at her mother, the person who's literally inflicting unbelievable pain through foot binding, you know, in the name of love. By the time I got the peony in love, I completely changed my opinion. I thought it's less about how a da- you know, a daughter would look at her mother than how mothers look at their children and how, you know, when you're little, we can you know, put them on their shoulder, comfort right. them, or, you know, help them. But, you know, they do grow up, right? They grow up, they go right. to college, they, they get jobs, they get married, they have kids, their kids don't like them, their wives leave them, <laughs> you know, they lose their job, they lose the house, all these things happen. Well, right. at that point, you can't take your baby and put her like this right. and go, you know, pack it up. Um, what we do as mothers is we take their pain and carry it in our hearts, and that's a mother's love. Um, that again, love and pain. So here I am, right? I, and you know, it's weird. Obviously, I know who all the characters are, but I hadn't actually thought about how many mothers and daughters were in this book, or mothers and children. Yes. Um, Twelve days before the book was due. My mom was diagnosed with cancer, and she died 10 days later. 
Wow. And, uh, you know, I mean, then you're like, uh, you know, right, taking this for life and getting the memorial and things like that. I'm going to finish the book. And you still, even though it's done, you still have copy editing and all of these things. And it was about two months later that I'm looking at the manuscript, you know, yet another time. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I get what this is about. Again, you know, thematically, deep in it, it's, again, about mother love, this idea of love and pain. But, um, you know, I, my mom, you know, we didn't know how sick she was until the end, but she had had a pretty tough couple of years. And so I, I think at some subconscious level, I, I was writing, you know, sort of about what was going on around me in that sense that we will all have at some point of losing our mothers right. and a sense of separation. Because one thing is true in this book, there's a lot of separation. Yes. You know, that my son is separated from her mother. She's separated from her daughter. Um, Deja has a different kind of separation from her twins, as you know. We're right. not going to give anything away about that. But, right. you know, that, that sense of separation uh, that sometimes is just physical and sometimes it's permanent. And that that, too, is a sense, again, this idea of mother love, love, and pain. Uh, that, that really, I mean, I hadn't even thought about that, but that really does sum up this book. I mean, it really does. And, and I, can't say enough, <laughs> I can't say enough awesome things about it because I loved it so much. And there were so many, I kept making notes and I was writing every, every part that moved me, I wrote notes down about it, you know, because I really wanted to remember because for me, especially I read a lot of books and it's so easy to move on to the next one and move on to the next one. And I'm, I'm trying to take away something from every book that I've read and, and I took away so much amazing things from this book. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for bringing China to me, for, you know, opening up that world. And because and, I started looking at some maps of where it was and, and I was like, wow, you know, I just never think about this. Like I said, it's not part of our culture. And but then there's so much to learn. And I love history. And you brought so much history to it. And and of course, now I will be drinking tea, which is an <laughs> I will be drinking tea in the afternoon. I decided coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. That's that's how I'm going to. Okay. Oh. And, yeah. <laughs> and try to experiment. I'm not Lipton. I'm going to go to experiment. I'm going to go buy teas and, and see yes, what I can find. Them. Because there's so many, you know, of course, and from yes. all around the world. Yes. So, I just wanted to mention one thing when you were saying you looked up maps and things. I have a lot of stuff on my website um, you do. for people you look do. at, you yes. know, photos from my trip and, and, you know, lots of video of the Aka people and doing their traditions um, lots of stuff about you tea, do. so it's really, a, I, I really, I, I, you know, I can't even say this in a humble way, but I just have to tell you, it's really good material there. It really is. And I know that a lot of book clubs, you know, go there and, and look at stuff, um, and it, I just think it's been really great for people. So, yes, just, absolutely, because a lot of times I go on author websites, and it's like they just list their books. Okay, right. but you're right. When I went, I I done all that other research, and then I went on your website to yeah. in, you know, and, and then there's it. that section, and I was steps. like, oh, look right. at this! You have videos, yeah. you have all kinds of great yeah. stuff on there. So everybody, yeah. you know, every, I will. I, almost every book has a section that's like step inside yes. the world of, of and absolutely. once you step inside, you know, the tea girl of hummingbird lane, then it's everything about that all in one spot. So yes, um, yes, maybe yes. people enjoy that. Yes, it was amazing, and um, I, I wanted to know. So you said you're working on your next book. Like, do you have a release date for it yet? Uh, we're talking about. I think it's April 2019. Okay, so we so, can, a little a year and a half away from now, more or less. Right, so it gives everybody the opportunity to read all your books by then, and um, I, I will have all your I will have your website link under here for people to be able to go to, along with all your other links. And uh, can you hold up the book one more time so everybody can see the cover? Because yeah. it's so beautiful. Look at that picture. Ugh. It just I love it. I love it with the tea leaves and her face. It's yeah. so beautiful. So pretty. so pretty. Thank you. I'm so happy that I got to know you, and I'm so happy I was able to talk to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is so great that we get to just do this. You're in your kitchen. I'm in my I office. Know, it's I lovely. Know. I think it's fun. Exactly. So I can't wait for your next book. We'll keep in touch, and I can't wait to read it, Lisa.
Great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay.